Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you for coming today and for introducing yourself. So we are talking on the topic of the Bhagavad Gita in the age of science. Most of us, most of you are from engineering or some kind of scientific backgrounds and even if you are not, we are all influenced by science because the effects of science, especially in terms of technology, are all around us today. So, there are two broad terms. There is science and there is scientism. Has anyone heard this word scientism? Okay, thank you. What do you think it means? Yes, thank you. So, science is you could say more a method for acquiring knowledge, where we observe, we theorize, we experiment and we come to certain conclusions. A scientism is an ideology and it's an ideology which holds that science alone has the answers to all questions and any question that science doesn't ask or science doesn't answer is not worth asking. What do I mean by this? Suppose someone asks you, does your mother love you? Now, if you have grown up in reasonably decent families and even if we haven't, most of the time they would say, yes, of course my mother loves me. Hey, but if somebody asks you, can you give scientific proof that your mother loves you? Well. What do you mean by scientific proof? How do you prove that? So now, the point here is not to minimize science, but to contextualize science. Contextualize science means, science is a very powerful tool for acquiring knowledge about the way the material world, the natural world around us works. But there is a lot more to reality beyond the interaction of natural phenomena. And when we look at the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhag science asks basically questions primarily about how. How do things work? You know, how, how, does, how does this fruit fall from the sky? How do the planets stay in orbit? Uh, but in the Bhagavad Gita, asks the question why? Why does anything exist at all? Of course, this is an oversimplification, but it is a broad indicator. That the why questions, why does anything exist at all? Why does the mechan science mate can explain that it is gravity that causes objects to fall down, that is true. But why does gravity exist at all? So, why does anything exist at all? The why questions, why do we exist? how we can live in terms of, okay, we can fly by cars, we can, we can fly by planes or we can move by cars or we can surf on the net. These are, these are two different things. There is the means for living and there is the meaning of living. The means for living can be improved enormously by science. In the past, people might walk or go on bullock carts. Now, we can go on jumbo jet planes. In future, we may have rockets taking us from one city to another, one, country, one part of the world to another part of the world also. So, the means of living is very important and science can improve it tremendously. But the meaning of living, why do I exist at all? This is equally important. And this is what we get answer for in the Bhagavad Gita. So there, we could say broadly speaking, there are many, there are many questions which we need to have answers for, for to move forward in our life. Science can provide us velocity, but it is the Bhagavad Gita will provide us direction, which. I can go very fast, but which direction should I go in my life? What should I do 
by which I can attain fulfillment in my life, as I said, we can have a meaningful life. So, I'll talk about this. So, broadly speaking, we as the thesis that I'm making is that if we consider our life, in our life, science is one body of knowledge. Science exists because we exist. Our existence is fundamental. And because we exist, we do science and scientific body of knowledge comes up. So, science is one way of knowing the world. Albert Einstein said that the sciences, the arts and the religions, they are all shoots of the same tree of human knowledge. So, science is where you look at the natural world and try to understand how it works. Arts are where we try to replicate it through music, through, through painting, through various, through literature. And religion, at that time there was no differentiation between religion and spirituality. That differentiation in the last 20, 30 years. So, when he said religion is, we ask the questions, okay, why does this exist at all? The question of existence, the nature, the why of existence, that's what is asked over here. So, it's the same human, human spirit of wanting to know, it has different fruits. And so, I'll talk about four things, which we all need to know in order to live a meaningful life. And these are questions which are best answered through spiritual wisdom texts like the Bhagavad Gita. So, I will use an acronym called MAIL. Talk about four points. Now, these four points are primarily indicators of things which are important for us, but things which we ourselves do not so easily know. So, the first thing which affects us immediately is the mind. What do I mean by the mind? There is something inside us that works against us, that makes us our own enemies. Have any of you felt any time that you are your own enemy? Almost every one of us. Sometimes we have some great opportunity and we do something stupid. Maybe say, some many of us may be following sports like cricket. You know, team is winning, but a player plays a stupid shot. And then they lose, not because the opposite team played better, but it's because they, they played stupid. So, they lost because of themselves, not because of anyone else in hockey or in football, it is called a self goal. So, we all do that sometimes. So, what is this thing inside us that works against us? Now, psychology is the study of, as the word says, logos, the study, psyche is the mind. But, over the centuries, science has become more and more reductionistic. And its study is, so the famous scientist B. F. Skinner or somebody else said that, I refuse to study the mind because it has no locus standi. Where is the mind? If you take a microscope or any kind of CT scan or whatever, you can't find the mind in the, inside the body. Yes. If something can't be, whose presence can't be detected by science, why should we study it? Now, so, many psychologists now say that start, psycho, psychology is the study of human behavior, not the study of the mind, which is okay, but it is the mind that impels human behavior. So, the mind affects all of us and yet the concept of mind is, I could say, in many ways out of syllabus for science. Now, what do I mean by out of syllabus? That often in science, the mind is reduced down to the body to the brain basically. There is definitely a part uh, of, there is a relationship between the mind and the brain. But, there is a seat of emotions within us, which is different simply from the brain. That ultimately when we laugh or when we cry, certain chemicals are secreted in the brain. But that secretion alone is not the emotion. That secretion is the result of the emotion. It's just like when we are happy, we may smile. Now, a smile is a result of happiness. 
if we could force somebody to smile, smile. If you would get a machine, and you press it on your face, and your face shifts into a smile. It's like a secretary smile. And we may have that, but how happy is such a person going to be? So a smile is a result of happiness. A smile itself is not happiness. So similarly, the brain and the changes in the brain states are the result of certain emotions that we experience. They are themselves not the emotion. Laughter is not just some secretion, happiness or sorrow. It's not just some secretion in the brain, some chemical secretion. It's a deep experience, something within us. And that is expressed as certain change of chemicals in the brain. Now, of course, if somebody is always very glum, with drooping shoulders, and you say, come on, cheer up, smile. And yes, you may feel better. If somebody is always glum, cheer up and smile, you feel better. But suppose say one of you is told, come on, cheer up. And see, you are the chair on which you are sitting is filled, or the seat below you is filled with thorns. And then tell me, somebody tells you, smile. Well, you may smile, but that alone is not going to make you happy. So, to some extent, when certain chemicals go down in the brain, we might take antidepressants and we might feel better. But after some time, the antidepressants stop working. Because what happens, the brain gets desensitized to them. And then you need more and more dosages, more and more dosages. So the point is that mind is something separate. And the brain is connected with the mind. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that there is a three-level reality. This three-level is physical, Mental and oh God, this is silly. Spiritual, or you could say body. Body, okay, come on, body. I'll just leave it. Body, mind, and soul. So physical, mental, and spiritual. And this understanding can be very empowering. So what the Gita tells us is, it gives us a model of the self. Wherein we understand ourselves better. That the mind is like a software, the body is like the hardware, the soul is like the user. Software can be a very powerful tool if it is working well. But if it gets corrupted, it can make even a excellent hardware useless. So when the mind becomes filled with negativity, we just can't function in life. So, so therefore, the point here is, that the mind is something which is real for us. And in the age of science also, we see that so many of us have mental health related issues. According to WHO statistics, every fifth person in the world will have depression, strong depression during some stage in their lives. Every tenth person in the world will actually contemplate suicide. And it's one million people who commit suicide every year. One million people is one suicide every 40 seconds. That means since we started this talk, about 20 people have committed suicide. Worldwide. Worldwide, yeah. So the mind can attack the body and destroy the body. So what is this mind? Now, if you see, the Bhagavad Gita describes the power of the mind. It is Arjuna is about to fight an important war for establishing virtue against, against anti-social elements. And just before that war is about to begin, his mind attacks him and he gets confused. And that warrior who has never been defeated in any war is attacked by the mind so forcefully that he puts aside his bow and arrow saying, I can't fight. So the mind can defeat us without even letting us put up a fight. It's one thing to be defeated after fighting. It's another to be defeated without even fighting. That's what happens. And we all see self-destructive behavior in so many people. So what's going on? So at the very least, we could say that it's worth exploring. Our minds trouble us 
and if anything can empower us to deal with our mind even if we say my mind doesn't trouble me okay i know some other people whose mind trouble troubles them let me try to know what is all this about so before i was uh, introduced seriously to krishna consciousness i was studying engineering in the government engineering college in pune and while studying there i was also actively in, interested and involved in social service so as a part of i had joined a social welfare organization and on behalf of that i had started taking free uh, classes for the underprivileged children uh, near the college that where i was studying so i would teach english maths history subjects like that and uh, as we became friends and those kids and i they started opening up and i came to the most of them came from dysfunctional families yeah, alcoholism alcoholism was there and domestic violence was there in their homes and as they started telling their horror stories mm-hmm. i started thinking how much is really the knowledge of which war happened in which year and which king died when how much is that knowledge going to help them so then we decided to we means the organization i was a part of to do, we decided to do some anti alcohol campaigning and we got some anti alcohol speakers to come and speak and many of those people the the fathers when i met them they were not bad people they were very nice people and they were grateful that i was coming and uh, offering those classes for their kids but these kids would tell me that after they take alcohol they would become like a different person so then they heard those talks and they followed some principles and many of them gave up alcohol and we were very happy about it but then there was a local municipality election and in that election one of the political candidates in order to woo the people brought two truck loads of free liquor for everyone and not only the fathers but even their kids drank so at that time i started thinking there was a big shock for us it was said back that through education we are opening doors for people to walk through to a better life but something inside them stops them so what is it that stops them and then i started thinking that okay i see alcoholism among them but it's not just among them i see this i was in one of the best in better engineering colleges in india so but i saw it in my peers also one of the students as i studied electronics and telecom so one of the students who had been a university topper in all his eight semesters he was in the seventh semester when i entered that college he was brilliant oh god this is not brilliant what happened things were okay before what are you finding it difficult to hear is it better now yes okay fine thank you so he was a chain smoker and at that time he got the highest paying job in the history of our college in campus selection but unfortunately within 6 months of working at that job he was diagnosed with lung cancer it was advanced lung cancer and he died within a year so it jolted me again and it made me think that there is something within us and it was not just those people i also had a short temper at that time so i used to find what is this inside me that makes me work against me So the Bhagavad Gita says this mind is like a program. Udhare dhatmana atmanam atmanam avasadayet atmai vayatmano balhar atmai var nipur atmana. That in your mind can be your friend and it can be your enemy. The most important education that we can get is the education that enables us to make our mind our friend. instead of letting it remain the our enemy and this is the education that the bhagavad gita offered arjuna and it can offer each one of us 
how to make our mind our friend and this is the first point any questions or comments till now yes something like cognitive behavioral therapy can also help people to deal with mental health issues yes of course again as i said i didn't i didn't say that antidepressants are also bad in some cases especially when people have some serious chemical deficiency or some structural damage to the brain those may be required in fact essential the point is that we cannot have chemical solutions to human problems that means my life has stress or i have loneliness i have i'm pessimistic hmm. i just can't pop a pill and think i'll solve that but there are times when pills are important so we are not placing science in competition with scripture over here science has its jurisdiction and it has Now, Arjuna, when he fought the war, he did not use the Bhagavad Gita to fight the war. He used archery to fight the war. Hmm? So this is in no way I said I'm not minimizing science. I'm contextualizing science. So even pills have their place. It's only when people become dependent on those pills chronically, and especially when those pills are misapplied. That is, I have human problems, and then i try to take a pill and solve it and become it is undesirable now similarly we could say with respect to cognitive behavioral therapy or any of the many mindfulness techniques that are there they can be, they can be effective sometimes remarkably effective hmm. the key thing over here is that there is um, in any treatment there is pain that needs to be addressed if somebody is sick and they are in pain when the pain is very acute then you give a pain killer to them and when the pain is managed by that and then you give the curative medicine so there is an analgesic which is like a pain killer there is an antiseptic which is the curative medicine so so just as at a physical level if somebody takes a pain killer it's okay they will get relief in fact they may get faster relief than if they take a antiseptic but the the painkiller only covers the pain it doesn't cure the pain hmm? so, so they can take sometimes they may need to take but along with that they need to cure the disease also by taking curative medicine so what applies to the body also applies to the mind now any kind of mindfulness or any other we cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever we take to some extent they are like painkillers they pacify the mind but we ourselves need to find a meaningful purpose in our lives they can give us principles about how to live in a way that when our mind gets wild make it calm but that's a pain killer there is pacification of the mind and there is purification of the mind pacification means say there are there are negative forces in the mind there is lust there is anger there is greed there is envy there is arrogance there is illusion and sometimes when these forces arise we might calm them down that's pacification and that's healthy it's required but pacification alone is not enough you need purification also pacification means they are there but they don't agitate so much purification means they are removed from the consciousness so we need to move toward that also okay thank you any other questions okay so let's move on now a the each of these is a big subject and what i am doing is just giving an introduction so a is action 
action means how are we to act in our life every one of us we act in different ways say we you may pursue engineering you may somebody else may pursue medicine somebody else may pursue law as a law and we may pursue various things in our life but when we act how does action work how does the action lead to its result and how can we act in the way that is most effective the idea is there is the mind but there is also the physical reality and we want to function in the physical reality so with what conception what understanding what do i mean by this see for all of us i earlier talked about means and meaning so if you ask suppose there are three classrooms and you ask a teacher that is each teacher what are you doing can you see these stupid disagreeable kids i am trying to teach them and they are so ungrateful they don't learn anything hmm? another teacher you ask what are you doing yes. oh i am earning my i am earning my living so that i can take care of my family okay as a third teacher what are you doing yes. i am helping create the future of the world here what has happened all three are doing the same activity but their vision with which they are doing it is bigger and when the vision is bigger the inspiration and the motivation can become bigger so we all act but when we act the vision with which we act if that is bigger then our inspiration our motivation can be bigger so for our action the bhagavad gita explains so so if the teacher is thinking that hey, i'm i'm just earning my living okay then you earn your living and that's it if you don't earn your living if you, what is the use of teaching but when the bigger the vision the more is the way we can find meaning in what we are doing so the bhagavad gita explains that each one of us we act in the world but we are working as souls on the multi life journey of spiritual evolution and our actions are meant not just to give us the results in the outer world see we do the right thing and maybe some sometimes a good result comes and sometimes we do the right thing and still we don't get a good result so our actions are not defined only by the external results that we get results are important but there is a inner result that comes and the inner result is that that action makes us either evolve or devolve we as our consciousness we grow upward or we grow downward we create our own destiny so with respect to action the bhagavad gita's teaching is quite complex but we could say that it can be summarized in uh, in an equation have any of you heard this verse karmanne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana it's one of the verses which is well known in the bhagavad gita the krishna says that work but don't be attached to the results now it seems very counterintuitive we work for the results isn't it all of your students are working so that you can get good marks you can get a good job so that you can have a good career so we work for the results so what does it mean to work or not work for the results krishna is saying don't be attached to the results why because don't krishna is not saying don't care for the results he says don't reduce your vision only to the results there's a bigger picture going on over here so that bigger picture can be explained as so duty destiny duration leads to the desired result hmm. so what does it mean duty so we all do something say for example a farmer plows the land and sows the seeds that's the duty then the rains come in time in the right quantity there is destiny and then the season changes till the harvesting season that's the duration 
So duty, destiny and duration, when all three work together, then you have the desired result. So Karmanne Vadika Raste in the Bhagavad Gita says, Bhagavad Gita is saying that you do your work, don't think that your work is causing the result. If you think that, then if the result doesn't come, you will become frustrated. Now sometimes these two remaining Ds, they are so small, their role is so small that it appears negligible. Say for example, we eat food and then we get energy. And we think that I worked hard, I earned money, I bought the food, and I ate the food, I got the energy. It's really saying I did my duty and I got the desired result. But suppose our stomach is not working well. We have got poor digestion. Then we eat the food, but after eating, we don't feel energetic. We feel enormous. We feel bloated. So then we get exhausted just by that. So actually, sometimes the factors of destiny and duration may almost be invisible. So that time, what, so we, most of us, the only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> when it doesn't work. So, if we do not have this bigger picture, then sometimes what will happen? When we do our duty and we get the result, we will become proud. Yes, yeah, see how great I am. And sometimes we do our part and we don't get the result. And we will get enormously disheartened. So, the Bhagavad Gita gives us a bigger picture of our actions. Now, when I talk about destiny, what does it mean? Destiny is not some arbitrary unknown force who is working against us. The destiny is simply the sum total of the actions that we have done in the past. Some good and some bad. And they all come back to us. But some of them come at one time, some of them come at another time. So, just like say consider a cricket match. In a cricket match, there are so many times when a batsman is not out but is given out. And there are so many times when a batsman is out but is given not out. So if you look at destiny, overall it evens out. Sometimes we work very, as any of you heard, as this experience, you worked very hard but you didn't get the deserved result. Anyone? Almost every one of us can think of times, you know, like that. But now if we think deeply, we can also think of the other side. That sometimes we didn't work much, but things just fell in place. Our ego may not want to admit that. But if you look at it honestly, yeah, you know, I did this of course, but so many other things had to fall in place. That's how the results came. So when we understand the role of destiny, then we don't get, we don't, the English word is hyperventilate. Hyperventilate means to overreact. We don't get extremely excited when good things happen, when, when we get a good desired result and we don't get extremely depressed when the result doesn't come. So action means how can we act in a stable way. So when we get this bigger picture of life that I am working not just for the desired result, I am working so that I can create a better destiny for myself. So even if the desired result doesn't come immediately, the, my actions are contributing to my future destiny. Every good thing that I do is going to count. Suppose some student works very hard, but somehow the student doesn't get very good marks. Some other student just crams and gets good marks. Now that may be good, at least you get good marks and you move forward. But eventually, if that student is going to say, be a part of some international mission, maybe launch a satellite to another planet. And that, st that student doesn't have that knowledge, just crammed and got marks. Then they will not be of much use. But if they study it, they internalize the subject, then they will be much better equipped. So, when we have this bigger vision, that our duty we are doing, not just to get the desired result, desired result but to create a brighter destiny for ourselves. If I don't get the result right now, I will in future. That vision can give us a lot of motivation. Even when things are not going right. Through this bigger picture, we understand 
but when things go wrong when we get failure the failures are like a comma they are never a full stop yes they will come and this is not, this can be sound sound like a nice a positive thinking platitude but the bhagavad gita gives a philosophical context in which to understand this so how do we act we act the best of our capacity in our situation but not just for the results we work for a purpose bigger than the results then if we get the results we are grateful if we don't get the result we are still purposeful in moving on okay so this understanding of action is very important and that's what the bhagavad gita provides us again this is a big subject but this is just an introduction to the subject of destiny any questions about this yeah anyone else yes okay Okay, good question. So Krishna says in the Gita that whatever happens happens by my will. So if um, if it's not this time, then we may not even be able to start a work. Yes. So the second part is true. Sometimes we are not able to we want to, but we can't even start anything. Now we have to see what is the reason for it. Sometimes it might be that. if i want to wake up early in the morning and i put a mobile my alarm in my mobile but i see that the charge is only 3% to me and i keep it like that and put the alarm and at night when i'm sleeping the alarm goes off and i don't wake up i say why didn't i wake up it is because of destiny well it was not destiny it was our own irresponsibility so there are the there is something which is our part to do and the bhagavad gita is a little more specific when it talks about god's role in the world it is upadrashta anumanta cha in 1323 it says god says i am the overseer and i am the permitter it is not that everything that happens is done by god or is desired by god it is desired sometimes by people say for example somebody becomes lusty or greedy or or uh, angry the broadly speaking we consider all the major problems of the world you could find out reduce them to these three causes lust causes sexual violence and all the social problems greed causes corruption and violence and anger causes violence so now when somebody becomes greedy is it god who is making them greedy no it is there basically this is again a big subject but god has given each one of us free will and based on our past karma based on our destiny we all have a particular area in which we can execute our free will say for example somebody is greedy and they think i will gamble and i'll make a lot of money now they might have 5000 dollars with them and they can spend all those 5000 dollars and become penniless but still they spend 5000 dollars their free will the scope is 5000 dollars but somebody might have inherited maybe 5 million dollars and they gamble 5 million dollars away so now if somebody is gambling away their whole fortune it is not god wants them to do that it is they want to do it and by their past karma they have been given a certain the sanskrit word is kshetra kshetra is the area of control so each one of us has a particular area of control and within that area of control we can act in a way that is in, uh, that god would want us to act and sometimes we may act in a way that defies what god wants and we will be allowed within that finite area not beyond that 
Why? Because God has given us each one of us free will. If, the, if there is no free will, then we will all be like robots. We will all be programmed machines. And the idea that God does everything transforms God into... God won't remain God, God will become devil. Because in all the evil things in the world, it is God who is doing them. No, God is not doing those things. So God is the supreme controller in the sense that it is He who sanctions people to do certain things. It is not that He desires them. And people do something wrong, then they get the consequences of that. So the Bhagavad Gita gives the example, Yatha Akasya Sthito Nityam Vayu Sarvatra Gomahan Tha Sarvani Bhutani Matsthani Tyopadharaya That just as the mighty wind moves in various directions, but it is within the sky. So, the, you could say the sky is like an upside down bowl. And within that, the, so the air moves. So, the, the sky limits the area of movement of the wind, not the movement itself. Similarly, our area of movement is determined by God's will. But our specific movement is not determined by God's will. It is up to us to choose. So sometimes, now coming to your specific question that you are asking, sometimes our area of movement may be so limited that we may not be able to start also. See, for example, now one of my, my services is I speak. So if I get a sore throat and I am not able to utter even one word, so then the area of movement has become extremely restricted. So now I have a certain amount of knowledge and if somebody asks me questions within that area of knowledge, I can answer. That's the area of my movement. But if somebody asks me questions about things I don't know, then I can't move within that area. So all of us, we have a certain area of movement within which what we do is not determined by God. So God is the sanctioner is the overseer and the sanctioner of what we do. He is not necessarily the doer of what we do. If we act in harmony with his will, then we are, then he is doing through us. Like one last example, I'll conclude. So I was in Australia. One person asked a question that, if God wants us to do good, then why are so many bad choices there in the world? So many bad options there. So I answer, that's always the way it is in any multiple choice exam. <laughs> in a multiple choice exam, all the choices come from the teacher. But that doesn't mean all the choices will take us to the teacher. Or you could say all the choices will take us to the teacher, but one choice will take us to be congratulated and other choices will take us to be chastised. So, similarly, you could say God creates the area within which we function. But the options are provided by God, the choices are made by us. Okay? Okay. So, um, we'll, we'll move on and later on if we have any questions, we can discuss at the end. Any other questions about this immediately? Any burning, pressing question? Because this is a complex subject. Okay, so I is intelligence. One of the things which struck me in my college days was that there are, there are quite a few students who were brilliantly stupid. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Brilliantly stupid. Like this boy who was so good at electronics engineering, any problem, you know, just he would read it and he would immediate, immediately have the answer to that. But then I used to think he can figure out any electronics problem. Why can't he figure out that smoking is killing him? Just couldn't. So he was brilliant as far as electronics engineering was concerned, but stupid in terms of the life choices that he was making. So our IQ scores or many of our uh, many of our parameters for measuring intelligence 
they focus on specifically on aptitudes or rather abilities you know what particular ability particular person has and that's important somebody may have musical ability somebody may have analytical ability somebody may have verbal ability it's all good but intelligence the bhagavad gita says is not so much about skills as it is about decision decision making that what is the beneficial choice to make and what is a harmful choice to make that capacity to discern to discriminate and to choose wisely that is vital so now the intelligence and the mind are somewhat related but the bhagavad gita's purpose is what we get the intelligence from within to see what kind of choices will lead to what kind of consequences and thereby to choose wisely so our intelligence is like our inner light which dissipates the darkness within us and we all can improve our iq maybe by some practice some training uh, but irrespective of whatever our iq is each one of us if we can learn to resist our impulses choose wisely in long term that that intelligence can be a great power for us and this intelligence can be enhanced by the spiritual knowledge of the bhagavad gita and i want to complete and then we can have more questions so i'll keep this brief when the bhagavad gita talks about intelligence it uses the word buddhi hmm? the this word for knowledge is in sanskrit gyan hmm? so gyan or knowledge is more in terms of what you take in hmm? taking in information from the world is leads to knowledge but applying that information in the world represents intelligence so uh, sometimes a doctor may know precisely how smoking kills someone but the doctor themselves might be smoking so they have knowledge but they're not able to apply it so the intelligence is more related with application of knowledge and the bhagavad gita is essentially an applicational book it is spoken to a person who is out in the world in the midst of action it gives him the intelligence by which to act effectively for all of us it's often said that don't just work hard work smart so that ultimate way of working smart is what the bhagavad gita talks about through intelligence and the last part l is love love means that here i started by talking about how the bhagavad gita sorry i talked about how science itself cannot provide a scientific proof for the existence of love that does your mother love you i once gave a seminar at columbus on overcoming fear so that time i studied about the history of fear that means what are the top 10 fears of people in the 18th century the 19th century the 20th century the 21st century so in the 21st century there were two new entrants in the top 10 list one was terrorists fear of terrorists second is fear of rejection we enter into a relationship and we are afraid that the person may other person may reject us and go away is other person really is he really really is he, he or she really, they really care for me or are they just using me we all want to know that now with all the sophisticated advancement that we have we can, we can have a thermometer we can have a barometer we can't have a love meter you know before two people are about to form a relationship we formalize a relationship they are about to maybe take the sacred sacred vows or go around the sacred fire hey, wait a minute let me take out a love meter let's see what's in your heart with the love meter you know, it can't measure love is real but it is not mathematically measurable so what is love where does it come from 
the gita explains that each one of us is a soul who is a part of the whole and the soul has a eternal relationship with the whole that whole is known in different traditions by different names one of the traditions knows the bhakti tradition knows that a whole by the name krishna and because krishna is the whole all living beings are also parts of him and because they are parts of him so therefore when the soul connects with the whole the soul connects holistically with everyone else so for all of us we have two kinds of relationships i'll conclude with this point that we have horizontal relationships with the people around us and we have a vertical relationship with god with krishna so the horizontal relationships are immediate and they are important for us at the same time none of them is permanent they the while they are there they can be very fulfilling if they go well but they are temporary so the, what the bhagavad gita tells us is it gives a integrated spirituality yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam shrimanurjitam eva va tat tadeva avagachhatvam mama tejo amsha sambhava mama tejo amsha sambhava that everything attractive in this world manifests a spark of my splendor a spark of my splendor what it means is that everyone who offers us any love they are actually offering us a drop of the ocean of love that god has for us and wherever we get that drop we do reciprocate with that we have a loving relationship but we don't limit ourselves to that drop from that drop we move toward the ocean and bhakti yoga is the process of connecting with that ocean of love it is the process by which we direct our heart for developing a relationship with god and when we do this then because this vertical relationship is eternal it can be like a stabilizer for us in life various storms will come and when the storms come if you are all alone in the ocean that if i try if a wave comes how do you fight the wave you try to fight you can't hold the wave hold hold back the wave but if we have an anchor the wave will hit us but the wave won't sweep us away so for all of us in our various relationships storms will come and the waves will knock us over they will knock our loved ones over but if we are anchored to god then we will stay stable that is what krishna tells arjuna that be anchored to the divine and that can empower us amidst life's ups and downs sometimes <clears throat> when we are dealing with people there are probably two kinds of people some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go <laughs> whenever they go <laughs> so now what happens is we would like to believe that we are in the first category <laughs> but sometimes we ourselves might be in the second category for someone and sometimes the same person might change from one category to another so what happens our our own minds keep changing our moods keep changing other people's minds and moods keep changing so if we are over dependent on any relationship then we will be very vulnerable so therefore what we need is is we need all the, we need relationships in the world but we need a relationship beyond the world that will be like a stabilizer and with that stability you know where does our love come from how can this longing for love be fulfilled and not frustrated love often promises us the greatest happiness and often delivers the greatest distress that happens because the love is not well directed if it is intelligently directed that means we direct it towards krishna and stabilize ourselves through that spiritual relationship and then directed in our various other relationships then we won't shake so much 
we'll ourselves be stable and we'll be able to bring stability for others also and there is you know how to have stable relationships this is a very important thing in our life and this is also the knowledge that the bhagavad gita provides us so these are all concerns for humanity irrespective of the magnitude or the progress of, of scientific knowledge so whether we live in the age of science or not we all need to manage our minds we all need to act wisely we all need to have the intelligence by which you can take sound decisions we all need to know how to direct our hearts to love and be loved so this is the knowledge that the bhagavad gita provides each one of us and by hearing the bhagavad gita the same arjuna who had put down his bow being disheartened i can't fight i can't fight he had become disheartened but by hearing the bhagavad gita he became enlightened yes i will fight so arjuna's bow represents our determination life's life's adversities can sometimes dishearten us so much i just give up you might feel like that but if you understand the bhagavad gita's empowering message of love then you will inspire yes i will rise i will fight so the bhagavad gita can enliven each one of us to fight our battles in life and march toward victory i'll summarize i spoke on this theme of what is the how is the bhagavad gita relevant in the age of science and i started by talking about how for each one of us there is the means of living and there is the meaning of living mm. so science can improve the velocity with which we move but we also need direction in which we want to move and meaning means can be improved by science meaning requires something beyond science science asks the how question but we also need answer to the why question einstein said that the sciences arts and religions are all are fruits of the same tree of human knowledge so what does the bhagavad gita offer us in the age of science i talked about this acronym uh, mind what was m mind what was the acronym then yeah good thank you <laughs> yeah mail so m was mind so something inside us works against us i talked about my experiences with and with the, the, the underprivileged children uh, and their parents their fathers especially and how alcoholism means even if new doors are opened people are prevented from walking through them so what's happening so there is three level existence body mind and soul mind is like a software and we need to make sure that the software doesn't get corrupted then we can function properly so then was a was what action so in that i talked about we all need to act but the vision with which we act determines our motivation a teacher can say i think i'm just i have to deal with this disagreeable ungrateful um, dumb kids or i have to earn my living or i have opportunity to shape the future of the world so similarly when we are acting only for the results it's a small picture and if the results don't come we become disheartened but if you understand that i'm creating a bigger i am i'm part of something much bigger and what we do contributes to the bigger picture of not just what results we get but who we become so i talked about the four d's in action does anyone remember duty duty destiny, destiny. duration this needs to desire result thank you so even if our doing our duty doesn't lead to the desired result it contributes to our better destiny so this can help us to be dutiful without becoming without hyperventilating and then i was intelligence so intelligence is not the information processing ability in terms of iq or verbal or whatever it is it is a decision making ability knowledge is how we take in information intelligence is how we apply that knowledge so that 
ability is enhanced by studying the Bhagavad Gita. And L was love. We all long to love and be loved, but often relationships can become extremely frustrating. And even if they are fulfilling, they are temporary. So is our love meant to be all frustrated or can it be fulfilled? So the, so the concept of love itself is something which is out. Uh, science cannot have a loveometer, but love is what drives us primarily in our lives. So we talked about how the love comes from the soul and originally it is meant for the whole, whose parts we are. So we have a vertical relationship with God, Krishna, and we have a horizontal relationship with others. So it, because we have our, we and others both have our moods. So we will be unstable if our only relationships are the horizontal relationship. But if we are stabilized by the vertical relationship, then that will become like an anchor. And even if waves sweep us in the horizontal relationships, we won't be so disturbed, but we'll be able to march forward purposefully. And just as Arjuna, who had been disheartened, picked up his bow in readiness to fight after hearing the Gita, each one of us can also, no matter how disheartened we are, become enlivened by understanding the Gita's message and molding our life accordingly. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, actually, there are like, maybe a little off topic. There are a lot of situations when uh, our mind is conflicted. It is, it is torn between uh, a desire to maybe study, a desire to do more, and your obligation. And choosing one or the other might lead to you know, potential regret. Why you chose this or that. So in this situation, how do we convince ourselves, OK, whatever we have chosen, it's right for us. It's the best thing you did at that particular moment. So this has, I have always faced in such situations. It has always led to a lot more times yeah. regret that why I chose this or that. So how do you deal with this? Yeah, good question. When we have to choose, sometimes we regret that this choice may backfire. So how can we choose with confidence? Because both things, both things are good. Both are important, both are good, yes. There are two kinds of dilemmas. It's called moral dilemma and ethical dilemma. In moral dilemma, we have a choice between the moral and the immoral. And it basically requires strength of character to make the moral choice. But in ethical dilemma, both choices are moral. But which is the higher morality at that time? That makes it even more difficult. So that requires, choosing over there requires not just moral muscles, but it also requires a refined intelligence. In fact, the, the, the problem for Arjuna was that he was fighting, but against him were his relatives. So what should he do at that time? Should he do his duty as a Kshatriya and fight against wrongdoers? Or should he do his duty as a family member and protect his family? It is a difficult choice for him. So basically, when we face this kind of dilemmas, it's not just a, the Bhagavad Gita says that our, ident, our activity stems from our identity. That means what I do is determined by who I think I am. So we have various functional identities. This one functional identity might be you are an Indian, another might be you are an engineering student, another might be you are a man, another might be you are maybe Rajasthani or North Indian or South Indian or whatever. We have various identities and sometimes some of our functional identities may clash. As a student we want to do one thing but maybe as an Indian we want to do something else. As a student we want to do one thing, as a son of someone we want to do something else. So at that time the Bhagavad Gita tells us step back beyond your functional identities to your fundamental identity. The fundamental identity is that each one of us is a soul. We are parts of God. And all the functional identities are roles that we are playing. So we are a soul who is playing the role of a son. We are a soul who is playing the role of a student. And the purpose of all these roles is ultimately 
to go closer to God, to serve God, to be an agent of God in doing good in the world. So once we go back to that function, fundamental identity, then we can see the two roles with greater objectivity. Okay, now, because I'm a finite being, I can't do both. So, how can I best serve in this situation? So, when we go down to the fundamental identity and look at the big picture, okay, this too I can't do. If I do this, what will happen? We can see our emotions sometimes come in the way of our decisions. So, when we shift from the fundamental identity to the function, from the functional to the fundamental identity, then we can observe without being so much controlled by the emotions. And then maybe if it's important to see, we can write things down and get everything written down, write in pros and cons and wait for some time, maybe for a day or something and then revisit it. By that what has happened? You got a snapshot of your mind and then afterwards when you observe it, because it's outside, you have some distance. The distance brings some detachment, some perspective and then we can observe and we can make the best decision in that situation. Life never comes with the guarantee of the right decision. But we can get the decision making process right, as right as possible. And if we decide you know, this, because of this, 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 this reasons, I chose, to, I'm going to do this. Then if our mind second guesses us, say no, I made this decision, I'm going to stick to it now. But sometimes situations change. And based on the situation we were in, this decision was right. But now the way things have turned out, yeah, this decision is not right now. So we can change course also if required. So we don't have, we can be firmly fixed in a decision without being fanatically fixed. Firmly fixed means that yes, I have, take, I have done my reasoning, I have used my intelligence and I am going to do it. I won't just change because my emotions are changing. But fanatically fixed means even when a decision has leading to counterproductive results, still I stick to it because it was my decision. So broadly, how do we know what is the right decision and wrong decision? So the Mahabharata, of which, is a part, of which the Bhagavad Gita is a part, says that broadly there are three factors. There is intent, there is content and there is consequence. So intent is why am I doing this? Content is our basic reasoning. Should I do this? Should I do this? We analyze it all. And so in, we, can, we can try to uh, have as pure an intent as possible not my own selfish desires, but how can I best contribute over here? Then we can do our analysis, that's the content. And then we, we are firmly fixed. But sometimes the consequence turns out to be opposite. Oh, I, I had, with my understanding, thought this will come, that's why I did this. If the consequences is changed, we can change the decision. So if you have this broad understanding, so three things I said. First is shift from the functional role to the fundamental role. Fundamental identity rather, so that we can observe the situation with a little distance and detachment. Then, uh, then get the decision making process as right as possible. And then by the perspective, by the three points of intent, content and consequence analysis, we can be firmly fixed without being fanatically fixed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You had a question? Okay. And um, I think I was having trouble um, understanding um, for one about duration and also destiny versus desired result. You know, the, the way those, the sequence of those. If you could just repeat the farmer sowing the seeds example. Okay. I can give another example to explain the concept of four Ds. See, suppose a couple gets married and they want to married and they want to have a child. Now they unite, that is the part of duty. But not every union leads to conception. A conception is by destiny. By destiny. By destiny. And even after conception happens, it's not that the delivery is going to happen next day. There's a period of gestation, nine months. And after that, there's delivery. So that's a desired result. So duty, destiny, duration leads to the desired result. So that's the broad uh, 
analytical framework for understanding how our actions lead to results. Yeah, you see, the confusion for me is between the destiny and the desired result. Because when they were doing the duty, it was for the purpose of getting the desired result. So how did you distinguish between the destiny and the desired result? They both seem to be what you're striving for. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I phrased it in a way that was confusing. So, are we striving for destiny or are we striving for the desired result? Okay, that's a good point. So, basically, uh, okay, mm, I could draw it, but you can visualize it. All of you are sharp enough to visualize. Imagine there is a big water tank mm -hmm. and in which water is going in from one pipe and then water comes out from another pipe. But inside, it's not just a plain water tank. In that wat water tank, there are many pipelines. Mm -hmm. So, some pipelines, one pipeline is just straight, water goes in from here, comes out from here. Mm -hmm. Other pipeline is, water just goes round, 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 round and then it comes out. Mm -hmm. Other pipeline is, the water goes round and round and round and round and round and after a long time it comes out. Mm -hmm. So, for all of us, when we work, that's like putting water into the tank. Mm. And when we get the result, mm, that is like the water coming out. So now imagine, to just to make this picture a little more complicated, that say all these pipes, the straight pipe, the twisted pipe, the super twisted pipe, all three are connected to the same inlet. And there's a knob which shifts unpredictably. And sometimes this water just goes straight into the straight pipe and comes out. Sometimes it stays inside for a long time. Mm? So now in which position the knob is we don't know. So sometimes what happens when it's in a, the knob is in the position where we do the action and the water flows through and we get the result. So in those situations you could say that the destiny is favorable that the duration is very less and we get the result. So, but if the water flows in, but, so, but water does not come out from here. What has happened over there is that the water has gone inside. So, in this case that water did not flow out from here, that means we did not get the desired result, but that water has not got wasted that water has gone inside and will eventually come out. That means that water is contributing to our destiny, our future destiny, in future when water will come out. So destiny here can refer to, how, to what all is required which is beyond our control for our action to produce the result. And sometimes that is favorable, sometimes it is unfavorable. But that favorable and unfavorable is not arbitrary. That favorable and unfavorable working of destiny is also determined by our past good or bad actions. And therefore, if our actions, the water does not flow directly out from here to here, then still, so the water. So, in one sense, the duty of pushing the water here, the destiny of the water being on the knob by which it is flow straight, and the duration for it to flow and then the desired result. So, in this case, destiny refers to which knob, which position the knob is in so that the water will flow accordingly in that pipe. That is destiny. But destiny also can refer to the total quantity of water in the tank. Destiny can refer to which path the water takes when coming out, but destiny can also refer to how much water is there in the tank. Somebody might be, might be putting a lot of water from here, but they are not getting any water out there. That means that oh, all my good work is going waste, not necessarily. Maybe you are going through a bad phase right now, that is why there is no water coming out. But eventually you will come to a good phase where a lot of water will come out. So, destiny refers to both the path by which 
the water comes out and destiny also refers to the total quantity of water in, in the tank. The total quantity of water in the tank uh, you know, I see destiny as being how convoluted the pipeline is between the inlet and the outlet, but I don't know how to characterize the quantity of water in the tank. See, that's also an important thing. We, we always see, for example, some people may do a lot of bad things and still good things. They have all the good things of life right now. So why is that? That's because right now, say in the previous lives, in the past, they had put in a lot of water over there and that water is coming out now. So now all the water that is going in, it's like now if somebody is doing bad things, that means they are like putting dirty water over there. All the dirty water is also going to come out. But right now they are putting in dirty water but they are getting out good water. That is because there is a lot of good water they have put in the past in that water tank. And that's going to come out. But even the good dirty water will come out eventually. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention and thoughtful participation. Hare Krishna.